thank you again all for coming today and joining us for today's conversation. My name is Megan Hennis. I'm the Visitor Services and Membership Coordinator here at the National Buffalo Museum. And today we are going to be discussing um, bison basics, an introduction to bison behavior and relationships. So without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Alana to get started. Thanks, Megan. Again, welcome to Bison After Breakfast. We're really glad to have you all here today. I'm Alana Zenos, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Buffalo Museum. The museum is a nonprofit founded in 1991, and our mission is to advocate for the restoration of the North American bison through education and outreach. Due to COVID-19, the museum has been closed to the public, though we are reopening tomorrow. Um, we're thrilled to connect with you all here today, and throughout our closure, this has been one of the exciting things that we've been able to do. Um, so since we've been closed, our revenue stream has been minimal. If you are able to support us financially through a donation or through shopping in our online store, which has a lot of awesome stuff, you can find links to do so in the chat thread. Okay, thanks much. I'd like to introduce our staff again. You met Megan Hennes, Visitor Services and Membership Coordinator. Rachel Johnson is here. She is the museum's curator of collections and she'll be monitoring the chat and the Q&A thread. Bison After Breakfast is a bi-weekly hour-long virtual program that explores all things bison. In our first episode, we talked about the impact of COVID-19 on the bison business. In our second episode, um, we called Bison Beyond Yellowstone. We talked about different types of bison herds and how they're managed. Two weeks ago, we talked about bison babies and what happens in a bison's first years of life. You can find all of those recordings on YouTube, our website, and um, through our Facebook. Rachel is going to post links to recordings of those programs in the chat thread for you now. Um, and now I want to introduce our panelists. Boyd Meyer is the owner of Cold Creek Buffalo in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Cold Creek Buffalo Herd is located on the Terry Ranch in China. There are about 1,000 animals on 28,000 acres. Uh, Pat Thompson is also here. He's the herd manager of Durham Ranch in Gillette, Wyoming. Uh, the Durham Bison Herd has approximately 1,900 animals on 5,500 acres, or 55,000 acres, good gracious, not be bad. Um, and Ryan Malins is the owner of Four Mile Buffalo in Andover, Kansas. This is near Wichita. Four Mile Buffalo is a smaller herd with about 50 animals that run on 440 acres. We're so glad to have you guys with us here virtually today. Um, we call today's presentation Bison Basics, an introduction to bison behavior and relationships. And it's so important for ranchers to understand herd dynamics and bison behavior. Um, this ensures the health and welfare of their animals and of the humans around those animals. Today's panelists represent different size ranches and different ranch models. So they bring a range of perspectives and um, a lot of years of experience. However, um, they do all represent the ranching model where bison are managed as livestock um, versus the public herd or the um, nature conservancy model where bison are managed as wildlife. We discussed the various herd models in a previous episode that we talked about. It's our second installment. And Rachel's gonna put that um, link to that recording in the chat in case you missed it and you're learning, you wanna learn more about um, what we talked about there. And as with most of our topics, um, today's topic is really complex. We've tried to distill it into a one hour program, but please realize that we can only touch on these subjects. Um, we're not able to give a comprehensive education. If you have questions um, that you would like answered, please send them to Rachel in the Q&A box. Um, if we can't answer them today, we'll get back to you. And today we're gonna focus on two main ideas. The first one, is how bison relate to one another as part of a herd and when and how those dynamics will shift. And then the second idea is how ranchers observe their animals' body language and behavior to help make effective decisions about the health and welfare of the animals and as well as their own. 
Um, and it's worth emphasizing before we get to questions that there is really no simple formula when it comes to interpreting bias and behavior. You know, I, I wish we could give you some specifics, but we, we really can't. Um, each animal is unique. It's got its own personality and its own temperament. So we can't really just list the characteristics of bias and behavior. There's a complexity um, in the behaviors and it takes years of observation to understand. And I think sometimes maybe these guys would agree that you could still get it wrong on occasion. Um, one thing we have learned at, as we were doing our research and you know just been around is that no matter the size or type of the ranching operation, there's one thing in common to all bison herds, um, which is that there is always an established hierarchy. And um, this idea may be familiar to those of us who have, who have dogs, um, in, in our families, if we do have dogs, we, we sort of have a pack, a dog pack hierarchy. Um, and um, like humans and dogs, all individuals, all individuals have the, a temperament and a personality. So, you know, um, there's going to be an established structure, a pecking order, but um, that's, that's gonna have variables. So I'm gonna start my first question, Ryan. I'm, putting you, I'm calling you out first, Ryan. Can you talk a little bit about the hierarchy of your herd? Um, basically, what I want you to maybe touch on is um, if my analogy to this dog pack hierarchy is similar at all to bison, and um, maybe some of the roles of the animals, or some of the different roles in the herd, and how you can how you tell what those are through your body language. I mean, I mean, there's definitely a pretty strict hierarchy in ours anyway uh you always have a lead cow and you'll notice just when you go out to feed that that trickles all the way down to the bottom critters um our can you talk can you speak up a little bit i'm sorry i can't sorry I'm hearing you. oh there you go you there now I yeah said, you're uh, you're loud and clear now <laughs> we do have a i mean pretty good hierarchy here uh you always have a lead cow and that uh that trickles all the way down through the bottom of our group and, so what does uh, a lead cow do? Is she just like the? She's just kind of the boss. Yeah, anytime you're boss out lady. Dump, dumping cake or whatever it may be, she'll be the. She won't be the first one to you, but she'll come up at her own speed, and everybody else gets out of her way. And uh, when you go to lead, and she's usually the one in the front of the pack, and because we're kind of we open everything up here, and they kind of move around as they want to, and she'll be the one that moves to the new part of the pasture and. And starts everything. Everybody just kind of trails along behind her. Even awesome. uh, the bulls don't give ground to her if she tries to get bumpy with them. But uh, they sure don't take lead of everybody. You know, it's it's that cow first and everyone behind. So, and awesome. you can sit there and watch the group, and everybody kind of knows their place. The only time that gets kind of wonky is if you turn out some new cows with that group and they'll sit there and just go to town for a while until they find each other's place in the new group. So it's kind of neat to watch, but uh, there definitely is a hierarchy here. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, okay, I'm gonna move to Pat real quick, because Pat, you had a really interesting way of explaining how personality and temperament can determine behavior. You talked about the fact, you talked about this bubble the fact that every animal has a bubble. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, so um, how I kind of explain it to people um, that that come visit the ranch and, and people here at the ranch is that each animal, just like you and I have, you know, a personal space, we'll call it, I call it a bubble with the animals that they feel um, comfortable in is that area around them and some animals it's bigger some animals it's smaller and it you know it can change to where you know ryan and i have never met each other and so our bubbles to each other might be pretty a lot bigger but you know my bubble to my kids is a lot smaller those i'm very familiar with and so same thing with the bison i mean there's as you go out there there's animals that feel more comfortable with your presence and less comfortable with your presence um, time of the year, it totally changes, you know, calving season, which we're just getting to the tail too. I mean, those cows that are calving have a bubble that's probably 200 acres wide. You go, you go into that pasture, at least here, and they're, they're 
given to that pressure and heading to the backside. Um, we get through cabin, you go here into July and, and you can drive out there and, and they'll stand there 10 yards away from your pickup and, and check things out. Um, how drastically that bubble can change is that pickup can be sitting there and I can open the door and step out and then I've just totally changed that dynamic and, and what they feel comfortable with. And so, um, and the, the other way I explain that, like comparing our herd with, um, Uh oh. I think Pat might have froze up. <laughs> okay, well, wait for him to come back. Boyd, you got anything to add? Well, I would say something as far as uh, not so much speaking to you know, lead <laughs> animals, but is Pat back? Pat, you're back. Oh, you froze sorry. up a little bit. Okay. Hang on, I just got a message that I was unstable. So, where did you lose me at? don't read uh well i'll start so anyhow the bubble so um you know like with our herd here um they're not as familiar you know they don't see a lot of people just us right. versus like a public herd custer yellowstone probably not so much custer but yellowstone they get millions of visitors and so um the bubble here on our animals is a lot bigger and and a lot more flexible so you can give pressure and that but and they'll respond Versus like Yellowstone, that's that's more of a wall than a bubble. And so they're pretty comfortable getting close, getting close. And then when the accidents happen, that person stepped through that bubble wall and now you're in that animal space and and you didn't pick up on that body language. And then that's, that's where things happen. So um, yeah, it changes by the animal. It changes by the year. It changes by the person putting putting that pressure on for the bubble. Can so. you talk about that body language that um, you see just for a second? I'm kind of going out of order, but can you talk about the body language? Like what is one of the key things you would see if you had put, if you had put pressure on and they're like, kind of like mm -hmm, you're near my bubble? Yeah. So um, I, I probably make it sound easier to pick up on than it really is, but you know, it's just, <laughs> It, I mean, it's more like it's it's kind of like people watching, and you can watch people, and 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 if you spend a little time at it, you can see those people that are stressed just by how they act versus somebody that's relaxed, and so you can see that in the animals when they're in the herd, like a just, visible tension. Yeah, if you're if you're out there, they're happily grazing along, um, or even you know they're curious, so they're going to check you out. So so the head up um, isn't necessarily a tell because you know they're going to. They're sticking their head up, smelling, picking you out, just out of curiosity. Um, but you can tell as you start to step two and, and they'll kind of, you know, they'll start to flex a little bit. They'll bite square up to you a little bit more. Um, you can see it in their legs. They start to, you know, tense and, and just gather themselves up to prepare, to prepare for a reaction, you know, kind of. You know, you see a sprinter at the start line and before the race, they're, you know, bouncing around and loosey goosey, but they hit those blocks and that body becomes tense because they're ready to go. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that's, I'm talking about body language later, so I don't want to get out of order and I'm, I'm prone yeah. to getting out of order, so I have to stop myself. <laughs> so thanks. Okay. On our last program about calves, we talked about the bison breeding season and that's called the rut, if you don't know. And this takes place. Um, I would say during the months of June through September, but the most active months, July through August. And then during this breeding season, the way that bison relate to one another shift notably from the springtime. This is something we talked with Pat about. Um, Pat, can you tell us again, um, can you sort of tell the uh, people online how those dynamics shift from spring to the rut? Right, so for most of the year, the bulls are pretty laid back. Um, they just kind of want their own piece of real estate to hang out in. Um, and, and, but as the rut comes on, so for us about 4th of July, a little later it's starting to hit, um, those bulls become a lot more active. And as, those, as that bull activity picks up, it definitely um, broadcasts a, a little higher level of stress through the herd just because they're getting after it. Um, you know, the cows are going through their cycle and, and hitting estrus, and so their behaviors changed a little bit. So there's just, there's a lot that changes 
in that in that entire herd dynamic. Um, so, yeah, it's you know with those bulls becoming more active, um, you know, bison. It's a matriarchal society, but the bulls definitely start to play um, a bigger role in in how things get moved. They start to sort off their their group of cows as things become hot and and stuff they're watching over. And so, um, that's definitely one of the times that you're you're careful. Um, you pay a lot more attention when you're out there because you know you you can be there and there'll be a hot cow next to you and all of a sudden two bulls start going at it and 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 you can be in the wrong place at the wrong time real rapidly okay so i'm gonna i want to interpret for viewers here you said a hot cow do you mean one that's getting ready to yeah ready she's to be, she's an estrus she's, she's ready, ready to be bred yep okay and then one thing that we haven't talked about um though and maybe maybe i'm going to give it to boyd Usually there's a dominant, so in the springtime, we talked about this idea that the bulls kind of hang out by themselves, but then during breeding season, they, they come mm -hmm. back, and, and can you tell us, like, because, boy, you have a couple of herds, and there's more than one bull, like, what, what happens? How do they know what to do? <laughs> right. No, uh, actually, um, you know, the one herd, the commercial herd, which is about 700 cows, and we've typically run, you know, 40 bulls in there. And what we see in that situation, I mean, you'll see bulls, typically the older bulls will start off strong and then you'll see those bulls kind of sort themselves aside about halfway through breeding season. You'll see bulls that get injured that'll get sorted off. Um, and what do they, do, when you say sorted off, that means well, they're not Well, they get kicked breeding. out, I guess. Kicked out is a better word. You know the bulls that are doing the breeding we've seen bulls in our dna testing uh, we've seen a single bull breed up to 69 cows so, so the ones that okay i'm gonna interpret again i think so the ones that are not actively breeding and so for people that don't know and if guys if i say this wrong just tell me just correct me but usually what i have seen is a bull the bull will go sniffing around the cows and they do some, there's this like Fleming response where they make some kind of weird mouth thing and they're sniffing their, where they urinate to see if they're ready to be bred. Is that correct? And then, <clears throat> and then they kind of, the bull will choose a cow or maybe a group and then just guard it and like stand by it till it's ready. Is that, does that happen? Like I'm Well, thinking? usually, yeah, in my experience, you know, that whatever cow is in heat, you know, that bull will stick with that cow. Typically, he's not jumping cow, cow, cow. I mean, it's, you know, right. chasing a bunch of them around. It'll be one cow that, you know, he's trying to keep the other bulls away from, and he will, you know, be on that cow hot and heavy. And, um, you know, one thing in our DNA group where we have, you know, five to six bulls with 150 cows, you know, that dominance, I've seen it change, you know, say bull A is the boss and bull B's kicked out and then a week and a half later bull B's in there and then maybe bull C became the boss depending on your age group now that these are so they just they kind of like fight or they oh yeah they will fight to you know in that group of five or six bulls there will be a dominant bull and then you know number two number three number four and it's typically based on the age of the bulls although you know I've seen a bull gets past nine or ten you know, 11, if there's a, you know, a good, healthy six, seven-year-old bull, five-year-old bull, he's probably going to become the dominant bull at some point in there. But, but I have seen it switch and, and back and forth. Bull A was boss, then bull B, then back to bull A. And then, you know, the bad thing is you'll end up with an injured bull typically. And we're actually, we lowered our bull numbers this year in that DNA group, trying to cut down on the bulls getting injured. So to avoid that, yeah. Yeah, hopefully they were, they have enough uh, girls around them. They're not going to worry about beating the heck out of each other. So, right. So there's that ratio. You guys got to make decisions, some decisions based on whether you've got injured animals, and and then um, talk about somebody. I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna like be a teacher. I'm calling on Ryan now. Ryan, can, have you ever seen? Do you have uh, you have three bulls, right? You said. Right. Good 50 cows. Has, have they ever um, tried to like 
fight for a cow. And I don't like, have, huh? Sorry, I don't have a big issue with that. Uh, I keep my bulls are fairly staggered. You know, I'll run a uh, clearly dominant bull that'll be a you know like a six, seven, eight year old, and then I'll have a three or four year old, and then maybe a two year old out Got there. Got it. So, so they know their place clear. for sure. Right. There's mm -hmm. not enough in that same realm of size or maturity or they're, I mean, they pretty much know who's doing what. Who's the boss in that. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was in, one of the first experiences I had with bison was out in Custer State Park. Well, when I first started working here and what I saw was, and this probably something that you guys work hard to try to avoid, but I saw a, a bull like, um, standing right by a cow and then another bull comes up and then they're like snorting and stuff and then the bull that was by the cow sort of like um urinated and then like rolled around in it and then they were just sort of like standing there at each other and that is that the type of thing that they will do like that display when i don't know somebody yeah, they're definitely trying definitely trying to out bluff the other before they ever actually have to hook up at that point got yeah, it you know, it's when you can square up to someone and see who can outcuss the other one before you actually have to start throwing punches. <laughs> Got it. So they're like chest bumping at that point. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Um, let's see. So, all right, another element of any bison herd. It is comprised of one or more family groups. So a very small herd may, may also be its own family group. Um, and large herds like uh, Pats and Boys, there's probably going to be a lot. So, like, you don't even maybe know what the family groups are. Um, so, they separate themselves. At the museum, I, we have two herds. They're really small. They're about 15 head each. And each of those are pretty much in their own family group. They kind of hang out with each other and just go where, where they all go together. Um, Ryan, your herd's a bit larger than ours. Can you talk about... Um, your herd in terms of its family group? Does it have one or more? And what do you see in that group? Yeah, you know, ours uh, pretty much stays together. Um, within the group, there might, you know, we'll retain our heifer calves from last year and we'll pull them off, we'll wean, and then we'll put them back in. And they will usually mother back up and, and stay fairly close to mom for that next year. But uh, as far as the cows in general, they always, they always stay pretty close together now. The, the bigger mature bulls will go off by themselves most of the year and then just kind of be doing their own thing um, outside okay. of the season. Now, when okay. the rut starts and back up, they definitely come back in hot, but uh, the, the rest of the time. <laughs> what you guys say? They come in hot. So what they they're talking hot. about is <laughs> they're ready to breed. They don't right. care about these females until they are ready to breed. That is just awful. <laughs> well... This is the way nature works, I guess, right? Exactly. So, um, uh, Pat, real quick, I know we talked a little bit about this, but there's there's quite a few family groups in um, in your the huge herd. But you said something about how sometimes when <clears throat> you round up, and we'll talk about what rounding up and working the animals means in a bit, but the animals will come through together, and you can tell that some of them have have um, sort of stuck with each other by their tag numbers? Yeah, so um, like we had talked about um, earlier, um, we so we wean and everything stays apart for like at least six months. And so when the herds join back up, we don't necessarily form family groups, but there's definitely clicks. Um, but yeah, so as we, as we run animals through the chute, um, that oftentimes year after year, the, there'll be animals that come through within five head of each other, back to back, maybe 10 head of each other, because th through our computer program and stuff, we can see that timestamp of when they came through the chute. And, oh, cool. and so even through the pressure of gathering them into the corrals and then getting them into the alley and all that pressure, those animals are still hanging really close together. And With their so, bodies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so... Um, you know, it's, 
it's hard to, to notice when there's that many animals in the group out on the right. you know, definitely groups, but it just really affirms that when they come through the shoot that, you know, they've, they've been through together um, multiple, multiple times. So, and that'll cool. start, we'll tag those heifer calves and, and have a number on them, you know, as they're, when they're yearlings and, and they'll come through together um for years to come as long as they as long as they didn't get cold because of pregnancy or whatever so yeah they definitely have friendships that last a connection okay great um i have a question i'm going to take a question because we seem to have some time so a question came through the chat um exactly what behaviors are displayed for dominance like pawing the ground head butting urinating vocalizations that is one question um, and then are there differences between male and female dominance behaviors? Boy, do you want to take it? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I guess in the, the bull, you know, the, uh, the dominant behaviors, the fighting will be a little more intense with the bulls. Um, you will see cows kind of hook into each other once in a while, but I guess I don't notice as much the cows resetting that dominance as much as I do with the bulls. Pat, uh, yeah, he's shaking his head. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, the bulls, at least how we see it, because all the bulls are in, in one group. I don't know that there's a vocalization or anything, but you can be sitting there and there might be a cow that a bull has interest in, and these can be both mature bulls. And you can see a bull coming from a hundred yards away. And as he shows up on the scene, that bull that might've had that cow, whatever that other bull broadcast coming in, that bull that had that cow is like, I don't want any of this. I'm out of here. And so they're, you know, they know who the study is. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, all right. So we talked a lot about the rut. We kind of got ahead of ourselves, so I'll be explaining some things as we get, we go forward. But we talked about how herd dynamics shift during the rut, during the breeding season. But then they shift again, and you guys mentioned when calves are weaned, or when you talked about weaning. So in, for, for viewers, in a ranch setting, weaning is an intentional management practice, which typically involves moving calves into a different pasture than their mothers so that they can no longer nurse. Um, and so, you know, calves are born between mid-April and mid-June, and they're typically weaned in late fall or early winter. Um, and so uh, a lot of ranchers will uh, separate the animals at that time. So um, let's see. Oh, yeah. And then we talked about weaning a little bit last week in our installment about calves, um, if you want to learn more about that. So, Pat, I'm going to I'm going to pick on you again. Can you talk about what weaning calves means for um, family group dynamics at, at Durham? Yeah, so that definitely um, breaks that family group more or less because um, those calves, so we wean in November, and so those calves will be in their own herd all winter long, and then about right now, if, if conditions are good, um, Th that calf group will be put back into the cow herd. And so um, we haven't noticed um, once that, that join happens, um, we haven't noticed any of those now yearlings that are wanting to hook back up with their moms. Their moms have their own offspring again at that point in time. And so that's where we see that more of that high school click um dynamic because they they spent all that winter together and, and they've joined they've formed their own social groups in that time and so when that join happens um it's like the freshmen walking into the high school for the first time you know they're clinging to each other pretty hard because they're now <laughs> they're now little fish in the big sea instead of thinking they're big fish in the little sea so um got it yeah. So, so then you're the thing I think we talked about is that then um, the groups sort of form by age. And this is another thing talking, going back to what we said earlier about how when you um, run the animals through and you see the same animals year after year come in with um, within a certain amount of time that were kind of born around the same time. This is seems to suggest that the family dynamic or, or the bond that they get when they're weaned is really important. 
Yeah, for sure, because they definitely, and Boyd probably wants to jump in there. I see. Well, I was going to say the bond, you know, based on, you know, we take the calves right when we're weaning, so, you know, they're in sequential order. Um, you'll see those animals stick together, you know, for the next year. You know, you can run them through and sort them two or three different times. And so that tells me that those, you know, they were, they made that bond as they were growing up as calves with their mothers. And, uh, and one thing, I don't know, it's kind of sappy. Sometimes my kids will ask me why I do it, but if animals come through and say we're sizing two or three different ways and they're the same, you know, it's 21 and 22, you know, I try, unless they're just miles apart on their size, try to keep them together. I don't know why that's just kind of a sappy thing I do, but to keep them with you want to keep the family together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but socially, and so you know, like us and Boyd, we're also into raising animals for meat, and so when you break that social dynamic, that hurts that animal's performance for a length of time, and so that's you know that's that's a factor that we take in with how we manage. So. So going back to what Boyd says, Boyd, you were talking about sizing. So then I'm assuming that you're going to um, keep the ones that are around the same weight. Yeah, when we're, we're sizing for our finishing program, uh, you know, like Pat said, the animals that go to the meat market uh, mm -hmm. side of things, uh, you know, we find that the animals will do better, you know, if they're in the same, you know, Try to size within 100, 150 pounds. Got it. Because that is one thing you'll see uh, if you have really light animals in with a group of larger animals. Those light animals are at the end of the pecking order, and they they really suffer. I mean, they won't be able to eat. I mean, they'll get like last right. choice. Like if you're the youngest right. kid, you never get a second helping. Right. Right. <laughs> I wasn't. I would, I mean, I'm just saying, my, nature, sister might, yeah. my sister might be watching right now, and she might have been that person, but not me. <laughs> right. No, Mother Nature really, it, it, more than any other animal I've ever been involved with, you know, bison, they really, if there's a weak animal, they will, they will pick on that animal and, and sometimes, you know, kill it. So, oh. that's, uh, okay. I mean, that's just something I've noticed much more than, say, cattle or, Got know, it. or anything like that. Pat, you were saying something else, and then I've sort of lost my train of thought. Do you have anything to add? As far as? Um, what Boyd was just talking about, or was he adding to you? No, I think we're, you know, complimenting each other, same, the same thought process, because that's, that's the same thing we are here, you know, is sizing those oh, right. together, and, and so those the young one or the small ones would just have to compete against the small ones to get food and and right and I mean not to that social structure as as they go so yeah and I think when you're talking about social structure and boy you're talking about being sappy I think those two are kind of hand in hand because what you're saying here is if you're keeping them together then they're they're less um less prone to get stressed out and and have problems in that group that you're putting them in right yeah. And you definitely don't want that. I mean, that's not good because then I know where we are. Then when you say they're not performing, that means they're not um, gaining the appropriate amount of, of weight, how they should be um, when they're going to yeah. be ready to, to yeah. become meat. Right. Yeah, yeah. You just want to keep them happy any way yep. you can. Yeah. That's a good, I, I like that. Let's keep them happy. <laughs> so um, let's see now, where am I? We talked about weaning. Oh, we're we're now at our um, second main idea for the for the program. Um, the second main idea is that ranchers observe their animals' body language and behavior to help make effective decisions about animal health and welfare. And I'm going to go back um, to the comparison I did with house pets. I know it's not the same, but it's going to give people who do not have any. Um, experience with bison a way to sort of relate to what you do even though it's it's not the same um so i have two dogs and i watch them i've interacted with them for years um so i can kind of tell when something's off you know and i can tell by their behavior and their body language i mean we can all tell they have to go outside for first first of all um and then sometimes if they need to go to the vet like i i know they're not eating or um sleeping a lot like 
tails underneath them if they're scared or something like that. So um, I will make those decisions, change their food, take them to the vet, um, take them on longer walks. And so I'm hoping that viewers can kind of take this idea and um, relate it to um, managing decisions. Like you guys will have to make decisions based on in part of observing their body language and behavior. Um, you're gonna have to make some herd management decisions, right? Um, we'll just say yes, right? Right, you do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Boyd, when we talked earlier this week, you told me that you check on your animals daily um, for their health and welfare. And um, it's a lot of animals, and I'm assuming many um, hours and, and many years of observation. So can you just throw out some key indicators in their behavior or body language that you notice, like when an animal's sick? You know, and part of it, I believe, you know, some people, I'm not going to say have a gift, but I do believe only, you know, few people can truly look at any type of animal and understand them the same as you would look at a person and, you know, identify a person or say, you know, that person doesn't feel well. You can see that with, you know, with bison. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the obvious telltale you have a problem is that bison will separate itself off. But at that okay. point, you know, at that point, that animal is very sick. Um, so the key is to catch them before they get to the critical point, because usually if they're separated off and hunched over and head hanging and, you know, fluids running out of their nose and mouth, they're probably, you know, they're probably too far gone to try to save. But so the key is to try to notice those behaviors when they're first coming on, um, you know, within a hurt, the hurt structure. And again, it, it's, it's body language. It's the head hanging. It's the eyes. It's the runny eyes, the runny nose. Mm -hmm. you know that hunched over look um yeah but they are they are very hard to uh tell because if you get the animals moving and the key is not to have them moving you know chase you're not chasing them but you know if they get to running or something an animal that looks sick standing all of a sudden looks not too bad Got you it. Know, if you have them going through a shoot you can't hardly tell a sick animal unless it's really sick when it comes through the shoot because it okay. has the adrenaline going so so the key is to see them in a, a peaceful situation, I guess, and, right. and identify those number or those animals at that time. Like just daily life, basically, for them. Right, right. Okay. So, all right. So then, okay, maybe, so we talked about sick. Well, maybe then we, we also talked about stress. And so, like, maybe you see an animal who's stressed, whether it's, could it maybe have problems integrating with the other animals, maybe having a problem with an animal, maybe come from another herd um, is that ever an issue well for us honestly we try not to mix animals into our herds because that mm -hmm. is stress that's one thing i recommend uh, one thing we do with our herds i don't add any females over three years of age if uh, if you want to add stress to your herd add a bunch of eight or ten year old cows to your existing cow group i don't really like, like where you're going them. with this no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> It's like throwing a hand grenade in your herd and you'll have, uh, you know, major stress. So and basically um, they've already, after three, they've already pretty much established themselves and how dominant um, they would like to be. Right, right. So yeah, if you're adding an older animal, she might have been the herd boss where she came from. And, and it, it really doesn't matter if you add a mixed age group of cows, you know, mix those together. You're going to, you, they reshuffle the whole hierarchy of that herd and that you what that means is stress and that's what you don't want with your herd is a you know stress tell us stress. why yeah. you don't want stress and what can stress lead to sickness yeah so stress can lead to illness yeah that's and bad and then and yeah mm -hmm. then um like it seems that the social dynamics are really important here um, you guys want to keep everything even because I think everyone always says you got to keep bison. I mean, the best way to keep them is keep them happy. Don't do not stress them out. Um, oh boy, one more thing. Can you talk about how animals might react to humans when they get distressed or agitated? Well, I guess, you know, Pat was talking earlier about, you know, being in your pickup or getting out of a pickup, you know, if they're used to you or it's a single person or, you know, your body language, you know, you get out of your truck and you move, especially in a tighter situation. If you see them moving, you know, you stop. 
and you let them settle and you can get to where you can walk amongst them. And, and I'm talking yearlings, two-year-olds. I wouldn't recommend, you know, a male over three or a female over five or six to just go walking around unless you really know that animal. But, um, but yeah, you're, how you handle them and your body language is very important to how their, you know, how their stress level is. If you push them or ever get them cornered, you cannot corner a bison. You know, they are, they, their flight zone is much larger than, you know, a, you know, a beef cow would be. So yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. So the key is, you know, just reading that body language and they're showing you when they're agitated. And once they start to run, you stop because they will, they, I, they can run right into a wall if you force them to that, if they're trying to flee you with, you know, that flight zone I'm talking about. And I mean, their typical nature is, I mean, they want to get away from you. If you, fa yes. if you face them and you guys, uh, I'm here, you guys always talk about putting pressure and then releasing that pressure. So if you sort of face towards them, I mean, their, their first initial instinct would be to go away. Yes. Okay. So let, we talked about this the other day, so I'm going to like, I'm going to, I'm going to say, so when they finally do, like, let's say they finally do look at you and they're like, you stop, but for some reason, I just don't like the look in your eye today, buddy. How are you going to know that? What do they do? Like, tell me about their, their posturing, their, um, you talked about tracking with their eyes and stuff. Like, tell me, tell, tell. Tell our, our um, people who are listening, like you told me, um, you can look at the way they stand, the way they move their head and something about right. tracking you with their eyes. Talk about that. Well, the, let me, let me add one thing real quick. The one thing, you know, like folks in Yellowstone that get in trouble or even cuss or anywhere else, if you see a bison by itself, that animal is probably, especially like during the summer in any of the parks, that's probably an injured bull that has been beaten up and is really mad <laughs> and even though he walks he's walking really slow and looks calm you know that changes which we've seen on video after video of people walking yeah. up with a single bison and trying to get a picture of them but a single bison that is a telltale sign of that animal wants left alone and you better do that mm -hmm. anyway so what question again so so um what are the key indicators like what is their behavior and their body language yeah when they're like totally ticked off. Right, well, it, the tail up in the air is a true sign. You're probably about ready to get your butt kicked. Okay. Um, so it, honestly, if they're at that point, they're probably already moving towards you. <laughs> and it's probably too going late. to get kicked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you can just see typically, I mean, if they're coming at you, the tail's probably up. If they're moving away from you, I mean, they're just, they're moving and they're moving quick. They go from a walk to a, a full run and I mean they're as athletic as any animal I've ever seen mm -hmm. as far as being able to make those moves but the key is when they start to move you stop that's the key you know folks that come to work for me you know a lot of times they're kind of afraid of the animal so they try to be macho they're throwing their arms around there you know we had a kid well leave unnamed that worked for us a while and he ran several bison into fences and into things because of his body language Mm -hmm. You know, he would be swinging, walking with his arms swinging and, mm -hmm. you know, you've just got to really have a feel for that animal. Like I said, when they start to move at all, you know, it's unless they're moving the way you want them, then you just ease towards them. But if they start got to it. run a certain way, you've just got to stop. Got it. All right. I mean, that's great. Ryan or um, Ryan, do you have anything to add? Do you want to say anything uh, about that? Yeah. Like Boy was saying, I mean, if they're doing what you want, there's no reason to overpressure. I mean, you're playing against a lot of years of instinct. So if you keep trying to push them at that point, I mean, that's no different. Than, I guess a bunch of wolves chase them down, and you get too close or push too hard, they're just going to turn and square off to you. I think, I mean, most of the time they're going to try to flee first. And if they can't get away because you keep pushing or there's a wall there, I mean, they're going to get squared off to you. So. You got to kind of make it their idea and then let them do it. Pat? Yeah, they're, I mean, I jokingly tell people that they're lazy. They're going to take the path of least resistance. And just like many of us don't like to, you know, get into that situation. Where Confrontation, yeah. Yeah, 
we don't, I mean, for the most part, we avoid that. And the animals are the same way until, you know, unless you push them to that point and never release that pressure. And so, um, yeah, they're, yeah, that's pretty much, you know, decisions we might make temperament wise with animals. We don't see it so much with cows, but if we get bulls that, um, don't show a healthy respect for us that are too curious about things, um, they cause problems. And so they might leave our program earlier than <laughs> what they otherwise Troublemakers. Would. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know, we do, um, you know, we do tour bus tours in the summer and stuff. And so I don't need 50 people that are outside of the tour bus and this curious bull starts coming up because right. it's just a recipe for disaster. And so, and I don't right. want... I don't want that familiarity as a characteristic that gets passed on. Got it. Right. So, okay. Uh, we, we're coming to 10 minutes, coming to 10 minutes to the hour. So let's talk about um, working animals. So for those of you who don't know, working animals, this is just my lay person description that I made up in my head, describes moving them from the pasture into a corral system and through a squeeze chute. Um, ranchers are going to work animals for various reasons, but most of the time it's to ensure that they're healthy. Um, they'll provide vaccinations that they need and do pregnancy checks at that time. Um, also, when they work animals, they put I, they can put ID tags on the animals so they can have an accurate inventory. Um, they can make health notes. They have traceability records um, if they are going um, to be uh, meat at some point. Um, and then let's see where I have, uh, and then they sort them into different groups at that time. And many bison ranchers, and w these guys we're talking about today, um, they work animals using what's called low stress handling, which is just exactly like it sounds. You want to avoid stressing the animal for the health and welfare of everyone involved, not just the animals, but the humans involved as well. Um, let's see. Oh, and in the bison community, I've heard this a lot. You hear, um, you can get a bison to do anything it wants to do. That's <laughs> something I hear all the time. And so, Ryan, um, can you talk about how, um, how what you've learned about bison behavior, body language, herd dynamics help, has helped you work and manage your animals? Like, like what do you do based on what you, what you know about them? Yeah, I mean, uh, they always kind of have their set way of doing things, whether that be the way they'll go down an alley and, and hit a solid wall. So their natural thing is to turn and go back to where they came from. And you used to learn, uh, you learn things about them and use that kind of against them, use their natural flow and the way they move to, uh, I mean, it makes things way easier. Like when we sort, we just have an alley there and if you make your cut, let them run down to the other end, and you can step up the gate and just flow back into it instead of always having to drive them somewhere. Um, if you, you can do figure out how to use that uh, to make it their idea, it, it, I mean, it just it just happens instead of having to push, 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 and run and gun all the time. Yeah, uh, I think. Do you do cake training? I do. That's how I. Yeah. I, cake enough to keep them coming to my four-wheeler so yeah because we do apples yeah exactly yeah so Anytime can you talk can about on. what what cake training is for people and i mean would you would you have a cake truck come when you want to get them to move to a certain place yeah absolutely so in the middle i mean we have 440 acre pasture here and our sorting pins and, and catch pins are you know maybe an acre so to get Oh, uh, whenever they get done calving, there'll be, you know, 90 to 100 head out here. To come through a 12-foot gate out of 440 acres, you got to kind of definitely make it their idea. So, and it's not chocolate cake. It's not chocolate cake. No, so it's what is it for people cube. who know nothing, and what do you do with it? Yeah, it's a 20% cattle cube that's kind of a compressed nugget, if you will. It's about a three-quarter inch around. A crunchy bison yummy? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Kind of a dog treat. <laughs> Okay. But uh, you go out and you get them, you know, you just kind of dump it in a line so everybody gets a taste of it. And they get to where you go out and shake that bag and they come at the long trot ready to follow wherever you want to go. Awesome. Great. And that's, 
that's really, I mean, the way to do business as far as I'm concerned. That's you handy. Know, why, why take six people and drive them somewhere if you can lead them by yourself on a four-wheeler? It's, it's <laughs> definitely a lot easier and a lot lower stress. So Awesome. And so, yeah. Um, anything else you guys want to follow up with about that, boy? Do you have anything about how you work with their natural instincts? Well, You're one working? thing we try to do, uh, again, low stress, um, leading with cake is much better than trying to push and herd, which actually doesn't work very well with bison because, again, they can get to running and they'll run through every fence you have if you try to chase them around a bit. But, um, you know, one thing we do where we're working with a large group, you know, the one herd of 700 cows is as they get closer to the chute, there's probably, you know, eight stages to get into that chute and each stage we break them down more and more and more i mean we never Smaller get a large groups. group yeah the largest group that will try to push you know if we push them up an alley is 30 or 40 and then they're they're going into an open pen and then from that open pen which is a small pen you know we just keep taking them smaller and smaller groups to where they're down to four or five head and the other part of that too is when you get them in a closed area, they get agitated. So right. the thing we've found, and one thing I'm really proud of, you know, we've had a couple of years now of working, you know, with cows, calves, and bulls, you know, 17, 1800 total animals, uh, you know, not having anything, you know, being killed in the process of working them. And that's, uh, you know, that's something we're really proud of, but that's based on the low stress handling we're doing and breaking them down and keeping them moving uh, again, that I kind of skipped through that. If you have them in a smaller pen and you just leave them there, especially the cows and sometimes bulls, but they'll get agitated and they, they start hooking each other. Oh, you know, yeah. they want out of there. And, you know, one, one comparison, uh, you know, our animals, and Pat mentioned it before, our, our animals see far less of humans than, you know, Custer State Park, Yellowstone, you know, right. National Bison Range. I mean, these, those herds are, you know, subjected to people much more than what our animals are so when we get them in those situations they are a wild animal i mean you said we handle them like livestock where they handle them as but they're you know, still off, right but, yeah but that's probably the difference there being we you know we, we will administer vaccinations and those type right. of things and, try and to that's a whole hour healthy. right that's a whole, right, whole right. many hours but when i say that i mean that um you interact with them, you end up working them and they're right. in a fenced in setting. And whereas like Yellowstone or whatever, they just kind of roam around and do what they do. Right. And, and another key too to what we do is when we're handling them and you get them in the tighter situations with the corrals, you need to get them the first time, which means you need, you know, a, a correctly set up working facility that, you know, the animals, because if they run by you twice, if they get by you a third time, usually it ends very badly because they are very agitated and they, that's where they'll run through walls or they'll do whatever to try to avoid you. So the key is right. to get them, whether they think it's their idea or not, you know, that first time get them captured and, and get yeah. them pushed through. And that, that takes experienced people and a good facility, so. Right, yeah, there's a lot to that. I mean, a, a handling um, yeah. installment is coming at some point, which we will basically just touch right. on again. But Pat, do you have anything to add? I don't think that you guys don't use cake at your place, do you? Oh yeah, very extensively. You do? You do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. perfect. Yeah, like Ryan said, it's much better to lead um, and give them a little reward to follow you than to get back there and push. Whenever, whenever you start pushing, it's just the stress the stress on the people, the stress on the animals just raises exponentially. So one yeah. guy out there pretty laid back. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot, and I was guilty of it when I was first introduced to bison is a little bit of a swallow in your ego and, and just, you know, although you're planning on going through this gate, if there's another gate a half mile away that they decide they want to go to, you go to that gate and just you go with the flow, you know, you don't Flexible plan B. You gotta get out of your head that they're going to go where I want them to go <laughs> by God. You yeah. know, like, um, That's awesome. To a certain extent. I mean, once you get down to actually working the animals, um, you know, at that point it, you know, they, they may have to go a certain way, but you know, right. flexibility is pretty key. And, and uh, so, yeah. So, um, 
Boyd, I think you already brought this up, but I have it here, so I'll read it for people. So we talked about the fact that vice and body language is complex and it takes um, many years of observation and experience to become comfortable with. But there is there are some telltale signs, and these are for the people in Yellowstone. It's literally their tail, right? So watch out if you see their tail. It's not just a fly swatter. Um, if it goes up, uh, you're go away if you can, if you think you can. <laughs> Any other things with the tail besides the agitated? There's just ways that they are, like I know that they may, I don't know, we see things sometimes that say if you're, if the tail is like just normal, they're content. If it's not, you know, is there anything like that or is that just old wise tails? Talking to anybody? me. Any, I'm talking to anybody. Anybody, jump right in. You got a tail? You got anything about the tail? I think I've always heard that. Ryan. Hmm? Ryan, go ahead. Or was it boy? I, th I think I've heard that, uh, you know, if it's up, but then the end of it's talked over, they're curious. And then if it's straight up, they're agitated or something along those lines. But I figure either way, if that thing goes up at all, they're go probably going to come closer, whether it be curious or agitated. So. I just, you don't want to know. Yeah, either way, I don't want them to get to that point. If I'm out in the middle of nowhere, distance <laughs> is, my, is what I want. So the thing is, if you see that tail move in the upward trajectory, go away. <laughs> yeah, you're probably too close. You're very close. Okay, great. All right, well, guys, we're about at the end of the hour. Um, and uh, anybody have any final thoughts? You don't have to. It's just a, if you do. <laughs> No? Okay. My life good. story. What? <laughs> I'm just being a smart aleck. I'm sorry. Oh, don't please don't. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you to all of you. It's been a really great conversation, and um, we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and experience with us um, and with our viewers. And to our viewers, thank you. We appreciate you joining us and your interest in the topic. We know times are hard for a lot of people right now, but if you do have the ability to support us through a donation of any size, um, we would certainly appreciate it. Uh, I think they put the link in the chat thread. Also, uh, just so you know, any purchases made through our online store support the museum, and we have like over 300 um, bison-themed items online um, that, that you have to choose from. And that link is in the chat um, as well. And uh, we are also in the midst of an online fundraising auction. Um, usually we have an auction, uh, uh, dinner auction, but we can't have it this year. So we're doing something online. Um, there's a link in the chat thread and there's some fun buy some themed items and maybe some other wildlife stuff too, I think. And because we're about to open for the summer tourist season, this is gonna be our last um, bison after breakfast for a while until Fall. We really enjoyed producing these events and um, hope to start again, I hope September. So keep an eye on our social media webpage and email correspondence for future events. And, and with that said, if you'd like to keep up with what we're doing here at the museum, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. You can also join our email list um, from our website, www.buffalomuseum.com. Thanks again and hope to see you guys in September. Um, Bye.